Hello, and welcome to the second lecture of CIT 130. We, today we're going to talk uh, more in depth about the parts of a program in Java. Um, a lot of these uh, principles and these ideas do apply to all programming languages, um, but we're going to be focusing on how they apply specifically to Java. The first concept uh, that I want to talk about, and I will uh, upload these notes to the Canvas shell as well, so you don't have to write them down from the video. The first concept that I want to talk about is something called lexical elements. Lexical elements are the building blocks or the pieces that make up our um, computer program. The things, the pieces that the parts of the program have specific names and being able to talk about those will help us have a shared vocabulary throughout the class so that we can um, talk about things that we're working on, uh, new elements, new uh, pieces that we learn throughout the entire uh, semester. So lex lexical elements um, come in uh, eight different types. We talk about lexical elements as white space. That is literally things like hitting the space bar, tabs, um, hitting enter, the, that creates what we call white space in the program. White space is generally used um, for separation of lexical elements and adds a lot of readability to your source code. So we'll talk uh, more about that as we use it. Um, uh, functionally, it separates our lexical elements. Um, but it also will allow us, from an aesthetic point of view, to, um, to make the program more readable um, and create standards uh, of style that allow people to much better read our code when they come in at the end. There's a special kind of white space that we call line terminators. These are the pieces that we uh, use like when we hit the enter or return key. Uh, they technically get their own special um, lexical element, although they work very much like white space, um, but they can designate um, a different kind of separation between lexical elements because when we begin uh, a new line sometimes uh, it means a, something a little bit different. Um, but we're going to really kind of talk about white space and line terminators as sort of the same thing as we talk about them today. We briefly talked about the concept of comments last time. Comments are pieces of our programs that are meant to be read by persons looking at our source code, including ourselves, and they allow um, us to both remember what it is that we were doing and also to allow others who read our source code to understand what it is we're doing. Um, if you've looked at the first example, you'll have seen that I used uh, a large number of comments in order to allow you to really dig in and really understand what's going on. I will be doing that in every program this semester um, and you'll watch me put some in in this example today. Uh, the next important piece is something that we call keywords and sometimes you'll hear the term reserved words. Keywords or reserved words are special um, lexical elements that have a specific meaning within the language. Generally, we can think of them as 
commands um, or things like that, we will uh, be looking quite a bit at um, a wide variety of keywords uh, starting today and going throughout both this semester uh, and if you choose to take the advanced class there as well. Um, in Java 8, which is the version of Java that we're teaching to, there are 50 keywords or reserved words. Um, we'll probably be on the order of looking at probably close to 20 of those this semester. Uh, it's easy to find those lists on the internet. In versions of Java 9 and newer, there are half a dozen more uh, new keywords, uh, but uh, at this time, we're not teaching those aspects of Java that's a little more advanced and um, uh, isn't in scope for this class. Um, so uh, you can just uh, stick to what the ones that we talk about in here, and we will um, expand upon those throughout the semester. The next one is called an identifier. When we talk about identifiers, what we are specifically uh, talking about are uh, special user-defined names. Those user-defined names will um, allow us to identify specific values throughout our program. We will use them to create things like variables and constants um, and other program elements that we save um, data to throughout our um, applications, throughout our coding endeavors. Um, the next one is what we call separators. Um, sometimes you will also see the term, re, um, I apologize, punctuation. Um, there are a variety of ways in which we want to group specific lexical elements together, um, and we'll talk about a wide variety of those when we do input into um, specific sets of code, when we want to separate sections of code, um, uh, things like that. There'll be many times that we use these separators or punctuation. Um, they serve to physically separate lexical elements and also to group them together. We'll talk about all of that as we go along. Um, the next thing we want to talk about are what we call operators. Operators are uh, those lexical elements that allow us to perform functional operations on sets of data. Sometimes those operations will be mathematical, sometimes they'll be logical, um, and then there are a few other kinds of operators that we'll uh, talk about throughout the, the term. Um, we'll, we'll see them as they pop up, and I will continue to use those terms, um, uh, the terms throughout the, the semester. Finally, the last one we talk about are literals. Literals are actual values, things like numbers and letters, words, um, and there are a couple others like truth values and things like that. Literals uh, are what we assign generally to um, our variables and what we perform against with our operators. I'll put brief definitions with each of these um, items before I uh, upload this list. Um, I'll be adding a few other items in here throughout the lecture today, um, but let's start um, an example application, an example program, um, some specific source code that we'll be working with today to introduce and talk more about these ideas, and we will um, 
introduce another or more sets of ideas and concepts uh, as we continue on. I'm going to set my language to Java in uh, Notepad++, which is the, the text editor that I prefer to use for my examples, um, allows me to get some special color coding, and I'll talk about those color codes and how they um, correspond to our lexical elements, which um, can be a really valuable tool. Um, most uh, interactive development environments uh, also do these kinds of color coding. It's a way of helping to identify specific types of lexical elements to the, uh, to the developers so that we can see maybe where we made a mistake or so we can quickly find specific things that we're working on or looking for. I briefly mentioned last week that all of our programs or uh, applications in Java will start with public class and some um, some type of name. We're going to call this one conversion. We're going to be creating a program that converts um, that converts Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now going back to that idea of the colored um, terms in here, you'll see that public and class are in this, um, I believe, blue color. That indicates that these are key words. Public and class are two of our keywords in Java. Public is a special kind of keyword called an access modifier. Um, we'll be talking about those briefly um, in more detail in the second half of the class. Just note that for now, we make all of our classes public. We'll talk more about what it means uh, at a later time. Class indicates what this um, set of code um, defines. And all of our Java source code files will define some kind of class. Again, class is a term we'll define in detail in the second half of CIT 130. You'll notice I've already introduced the first two lexical elements in a very organic way. I put a space in between public and class, and in between class and convention. You'll notice if I take the space away from between class and public, they lost that color coding because um, the it's no longer seen as two reserved words or keywords. It's seen as a single new word that isn't one uh, that has spent that kind of special reserved meaning. Uh, what we've essentially done there is we've turned it into uh, an identifier public class when I put the space in there, that separation now tells um, the editor and later the compiler that these are two different reserved words. Now in Java and many, many, uh, definitely most modern programming languages, the amount of white space between lexical elements is irrelevant. As long as I have some space between um, word-based lexical elements like keywords and identifiers. Um, as long as I have at least one space between those, um, I've done enough. If for some reason I decided to put a bunch of tabs in here, that wouldn't cause any difference in how the, the program would compile or run the extra or additional white space is something we use for readability. In this case, um, when I do something like public class conversion, I'm making a statement. 
this set of code all goes together, we call this the class header, we'll see um, throughout Java that we have some kind of header followed by the curly bracket um, with stuff inside followed by a closing curly bracket. We'll talk more about that in a minute. When we have a set of code that goes together as a complete um, statement, we do indeed call that a statement. Public class conversion is a statement that declares this class called conversion. Conversion is what we call an identifier. We as users get to define the name for um, uh, for the, the 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 identifier. Identifiers generally are done um, as user-defined uh, terms. When we work with identifiers, we have um, some rules. So I'm going to define identifier rules now. When we work with identifiers, there are some um, specific rules we have to follow. Any particular um, identifier may start with capital letters, A through Z, lower case letters, A through Z, um, the underscore, which is the special character you get by holding down the shift and hitting the dash key. This It's like an underline that never has a letter over the top of it. That is called an underscore. We can begin um, uh, any identifier with an underscore, and we can start identifiers with a dollar sign. These um, are the valid beginnings of any identifier. Um, the rest of the identifier, all other um, characters of the identifier may be numbers. 0 through 9, and what the all of the things we can start with. Capital letters, lowercase letters, underscores, or dollar signs. So the only difference between the first letter of your identifier and all other letters within the identifier is they may not begin with numbers but they may contain numbers. That, um, those are the, the, general, um, the general character rules. Um, please note, technically it's said within those two, uh, but no spaces are allowed. We cannot um, separate words with um, white space. The white space, uh, as I kind of mentioned before, always indicates separation of uh, lexical elements and is required um, as the separator between um, character-based identifiers that don't have some kind of separator in there. Um, it's the way that we can uh, I, uh, identify uh, in the editors and by the compiler and as um, persons doing the coding or reading out someone else's code, um, you know, which things go together and which don't. So I just set that out as a specific uh, additional rule. 
although um, technically I didn't say spaces were allowed, but um, I want to explicitly let you know that they are not allowed. Finally, um, keywords may not be used as identifiers. One of the things that um, may seem obvious, uh, may not, um, in uh, coding is we need our lexical elements uh, to be easily defined from one another. If any two lexical elements um, can't be discerned as different from one another, then there's confusion. Um, context can play a role like it does in spoken and written languages, um, although in general, the general rule of thumb is that we avoid that as much as possible when um, programming and coding and in defining our programming languages because um, it can create unexpected results and it makes um, creating the compiler very difficult. One of the things that um, certain kinds of programmers have to do is write compilers for source code. So if you write, or the person who has to write the compiler, then you need to be able, um, you need to be able to easily identify one lexical element from another. And so that's why we don't allow keywords to be both identifiers and keywords, because it creates um, a very difficult um, identification process within the um, within the compilation process. So those are our rules for identifiers. Um, I'll talk about them a little more as we go along, because I'm also going to talk about um, some things uh, throughout the the this lecture and throughout the semester about um, conventions for how we um, not only decide what names we want to give things, but how we spell them. We'll talk about that uh, more as we go. So in here, I chose conversion. Conversion um, basically describes what this application does. Uh, I started it with a capital letter. That's because this is a class that I'm naming. Um, one of the uh, conventions of um, identifiers is that classes start with a capital letter. Let's go ahead and talk about identifier conventions. Um, is classes start with a capital letter, and um, if you do separate words, additional words, then um, you capitalize the beginning of each new word because remember we cannot use spaces. Class names begin with a capital letter, comma, and additional words in the identifier. Identifier are capitalized. All other letters are lowercase. Talking about additional words, if I decided to call this like temp conversion for like temperature conversion, then t uh, the first word begins with that capital and the second word begins with that capital the separating words by capitals makes it more readable. We can't use a space, so um, it's nice to have the capitalization. It makes it more, uh, more readable. Um, 
This type of casing is uh, sometimes called camel case. There are two types of camel case. One where the first word begins with an uppercase, one where it begins with a lowercase. Um, there are places we use both in Java, and we'll talk about both of those today. So um, the next thing you'll notice is I put my first line terminator here. What um, is typical for coding is uh, generally each statement gets its own individual line. That's for readability. We don't have to do that. I can put these items um, on the same line together and start putting code in between these curly brackets here. But quickly, the program will become um, uh, very dense visually, and it will um, be uh, hard to read. So it's just something that we avoid. Um, uh, three things of note here. When the uh, two elements are uh, different, such as this one here is a word-based identifier, this is a symbol. Um, all of our separators, um, most of our operators, they're, um, they're, sim uh, they're symbols. When we go between word-based and symbols, we don't necessarily have to have a space, um, although uh, frequently we will. Again, um, it gives readability, and each character really only being... Um, like uh, four bytes long on a you know a, well you know on a 32-bit operating system or whatever, um, it's not taking up enough space on your hard drive the code to uh, to worry about you know the that those extra bytes. Um, so we generally go ahead and use them uh, judiciously um, based on our own um, preferences and readability. A second note um, here is that um, there are two styles that you will see from Java programmers. The one I prefer uh, puts my beginning and ending curly brackets, those particular separators, um, in the same vertical column visually. That is the style I prefer. I believe it adds uh, better readability, so I like the way it looks. Another common style is to put the opening curly bracket on the same uh, line as the header. I do not um, have a preference for what you choose to do, I will always choose to put the opening bracket on a new line, um, but that is a matter of personal style, and I will accept um, either way. So uh, I, I just wanted to point that out. So if you see some people put that on the same line, and you'll see that I put it on, another, on a different line, um, just know that that's a matter of style. The reason people like it on the same line is it shortens the vertical footprint of your source code. From the top to the bottom here, um, you can fit more code because we don't have a line that just has a single character on it. Uh, but again, I favor the ease of seeing my opening and closing curly brackets. Um, I prefer that to being able to see all my code without having to page down or scroll. Um, the inside of this part of the code, this is what we call a block. Generally, inside of Java, we have sets of code, usually starting with a header like this, and then opened always opened and closed with curly brackets. 
that is something we call a block. Let me go down a couple. I'm just going to put uh, terms. And the term here is block, which is just um, uh, a set of related code uh, that uh, executes in order and uh, maintains scope. For now, don't worry about that and maintain, maintain scope. We will talk about the term scope uh, at another time, but it is an extremely important part of what a block is. So I am um, putting it in the definition. Uh, just, just don't worry that you don't understand that part of it for now. Um, in a lot of ways, you don't understand really anything about what a block is yet. But over the course of the semester, as you both see me do examples and work on your own code, um, the term will become uh, very, um, uh, very commonplace for you. You'll, you'll, you'll clearly understand it um, as, as you work through the application. The next piece of the code that we're going to do is public static void main string args. This is something we did see last time in our first example, um, but just breaking it down lexically, we see public, static, and void all have that same color as public and class. Obviously, we've already decide, or discussed the fact that public is a keyword or a reserved word. Both static and void also are keywords. Um, these kinds of blocks that live inside of our classes that we call methods, more on that in a couple of weeks, um, they are also always going to be public. Static is um, a, a, a sort of more um, kind of intermediate level term. For now, just understand that our main has to be static. We'll talk um, in gross detail um, late in this semester, near the end of the semester, is what that term specifically means why we need it here and what we, else we can use it for. So uh, we'll, we'll go into to, to quite a bit of detail on that later. For now, just remember that our main has to be static. Void is uh, indicates that this block of code, which will execute, um, is not going to have uh, a, an output of the block of code. It may have output to the screen, but it won't. It itself won't send any data back anywhere. So it 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 does what we call returning nothing. So it's void. Uh, again, if that's not crystal clear, uh, a lot of these things will become clear as we go through the process. We have to take some things on faith as we begin these processes because um, until we've worked with them, we can't truly or really understand um, what some parts of them mean. So the good news is, is as you do the first few assignments, truly understanding why we call this public static void main with the string and args there uh, isn't necessary by the end of the class, you'll be comfortable and understand what all these lexical elements really mean. You'll notice a new separator, a parenthesis. Parentheses are used to separate um, the inputs to specific blocks of code um, 
that's the most common use of them. We'll see some other uses of them later, but for now, this indicates that this string args is the input to main. We call the input to a block of code parameters or arguments. String uh, is a special uh, thing that we'll talk uh, in, in more detail later. For now, just understand a string as um, a set of text that um, we use mostly to print things out to a, a screen or to store in variables. And args is a user-defined name, as is main. Those are the string variable is called args. The block of code that's called a method, we've called it main. There's a specific reason we call this method main, uh, and we'll talk more about that um, later on in our studying of Java. The last separator we see here are these square brackets. The square brackets we're using to indicate that args is an array. You may um, very likely have uh, studied arrays in your introduction to programming class, um, but we will be going over those uh, in a few weeks before the midterm. So we'll go into uh, a little bit more detail on what an array is, but just know that this open and square, uh, close square bracket just identifies args, which is a variable you, uh, with a user-defined name, that um, is of type string array. So now let's go ahead and actually get to the much more interesting part of actually coding um, the application. So the first thing I'm going to do here is do double input temp and I'm going to put a semicolon there, and then I'm going to do double output temp. I'm going to go back up here, and I'm going to add an equal sign, and I'm going to put in 100.0. So now we've got um, a lot of new stuff to talk about. The first is double. Double is again a new keyword, a new reserved word that we're using um, in this case to identify the type of data that we're using. I'm gonna hop back over to my um, to my notes document and I'm going to talk about something that with a fancy, fancy name of primitive types. Primitive types are the types of data that Java understands. Oops. also to be bold. Down here, we'll make it another bulleted list. We have numeric data types, which are byte, short, int, long, float, and double. Our numeric types are broken in, up into two types. Integer types, which are the byte, short, int, and long. And floating point types, which are float and double. Um, 
obviously integers and floating points based on what you're seeing here um, are numeric types. They're, they're obviously, they're uh, nuts. They are not um, differentiated here. And I don't know why that keeps, that keeps happening. I'm getting used to that. Um, they're not different than numeric types. They're the integer and floating point is just uh, more specific than um, numeric. So I'll put them indented here. So uh, those are six of our types. Um, and then we have our non-numeric types, um, which are Boolean and car. capitalized. Um, in some languages they capitalize the term Boolean because it's named after a particular um, philosopher, uh, George Boole. So that's why it's often capitalized, but um, when we use it in Java we have to use a lowercase b, so I'm gonna put it there um, now. Boolean values uh, refer to the, uh, that's a type, it's a single type, there's no other uh, Boolean types. Um, they take the values true um, and false. So I'm just going to do true slash false. So we'll talk about that in more detail um, in uh, another week or two we'll when we start going over logical operations we'll talk about the, the process of, of truth values so just uh, hold on to that for now um, and our second non numeric is character which is our car uh, we'll uh, also go into a lot more detail on cars in uh, a, another couple of weeks. So for now, our non-numeric types uh, are something we're not going to talk in depth about. Just be aware that they exist. Um, we'll talk about uh, a lot more detail uh, about what they are. Whoops about what they are and what they do um, at another time. So let's go back to our code. So what I've done is I have declared two variables. So variable is a new term. A variable is a um, uh, a user defined identifier for holding some uh, value uh, variables can change. That's why they're called variables. They, they're, they're, their value uh, is possibly variable. It can vary. So what we've done is we've declared two variables for holding pieces of data. The first one we've named input temp. The second one we named output temp. The names are meant to describe what the data is this in this case it's an input temperature and an output temperature so we will uh, be taking some value as the starting value and then after the conversion we'll store that in output temp so we store the data we store the values in these variables the first variable we see our very first operator. This operator is the assignment operator. When we use a single equal sign, what we're indicating is that the value on the right side of the equal sign is being assigned 
to the identifier on the left hand side, in this case a variable. We are not assigning any value uh, to output temp at this time. When we assign a value, the first value, to a variable, particularly at the same time that we declare it, we call this process initializing the variable. We initialize input temp to the value 100. 100 is a literal. A literal is an actual value. Um, it is a number for numeric uh, primitive types. It's true, the word's true or false for um, for Boolean types and um, single ASCII characters inside of single quotes for cars. We'll talk again more detail about character uh, or car literals uh, at a later time. We're going to be really focusing uh, today mostly on numeric types. Um, so let's just really focus on the fact that this is a numeric literal. Now you'll notice, I even though uh, I'm staying with an even 100, I added a .0 onto the end of it. Why I have done this is I want to be explicit, I want to be very uh, intentional, intentional at showing that this is a floating point literal. Floating point literals, when they just appear by themselves, by default are doubles. So that when I do this and assign it to input temp, I am assigning a double literal into um, input temp. If I had done something like this, float input temp equals 100.0. Um, this would not work properly because this literal is a double. Doubles are um, stored in a larger um, memory space than a float, so the compiler would tell me that there's a possible loss of precision when I try to store a double inside of a float. Um, doubles are 64-bit, um, floats are 32-bit. Um, the, the difference really is the size of numbers that we can store and how much memory it takes up. So the difference between a double and a float is really just how much space it takes up but if we want to assign a literal to a float, we can put a lowercase or an uppercase F at the end, and that will um, indicate that I mean for this to be a floating point um, literal rather than a double. Both floats and doubles are floating point um, types. So when you see me or hear me refer to something being floating point, that doesn't always mean float. It can also mean double. The term floating point comes from the fact that when we work with um, numeric values and so let's say I do 4.5 the decimal point is um, you know in between 4 and 5 but I might also have 0 0.45 or 0.45 where the decimal point appears before all the numbers I also might have 45.0 where the decimal point appears afterwards. Inside of our floating point uh, uh, 
in memory, we store the numeric point, the numeric part, 45, as uh, in all three of these cases. But what we do is we store them with an exponent to indicate um, where the decimal point goes or where it floats to. It floats left or right depending on the exponent. So the first one is 45 times 10 um, to the negative 1. That's, uh, you know, that way the, the we get 4.5. The second one is uh, 45 times uh, 10 to the negative 2, where, you know, so the decimal point floats over 2 to the left. The third one is 45 times 10 to uh, the 0 power. If we did uh, alternately like 4,500 or 4,500, that would be 45 times 10 um, uh, to uh, the third power. Um, hopeful, or sorry, to the second power. Yeah, apologize. Um, so that's what we're indicating. That's why it's called a floating point. Um, and then these numbers can be signed. Um, doubles and floats can be negative or positive numbers. Um, so when we actually store out our like floating point or double number um, as a binary code, there's one bit used to determine whether it's a positive or negative number. Um, there's a set of, um, of the digits that indicate the exponent and then a set of digits that indicate what we call the mantissa or the base number. I'm going to remove that um, from our code, but hopefully that explanation makes sense. Um, I will also be removing this one important note is we cannot use the same user-defined name for multiple um, user-defined elements. I couldn't have a double and a float both named um, input temp because what, would, what we would really be indicating is um, two different variables with the same name, which breaks that rule we were talking about before of being able to distinguish between different lexical elements. I wouldn't know which one was input temp the double and which one was input temp the float. So it's not allowed. It will not compile and you will um, run into problems. So, um, you know, you just can't repeat user-defined names and it's... Uh, would be a bad practice anyway because it would make your code hard to read, but it is not allowed. Finally, we have our um, semicolon. That is a separator between code statements that live inside of a block. Generally, um, blocks start and end with the curly brackets, and then statements within that block uh, start and end with semicolons. Whenever we do other kinds of blocks, you can have blocks within blocks. We're already seeing that. The method main block is inside the class definition block. Um, and we'll see lots of examples of blocks nested within blocks starting um, as soon as next week beyond the main method being in the class. So I'm going to move on. And I am going to uh, do final int conversion factor one. 
actually I'm just going to do, I'm sorry for now, I'm just going to do conversion factor. And, um, no, you know what, because I want to teach something, I am going to do it in two. Conversion factor one is five. Final int conversion factor two equals nine. So, a couple things here. We've come up with yet another two keywords, final and int. We talked a little bit about int. It is a integer numeric data type, primitive type. Final is a keyword used to indicate that this is not a variable, but rather a constant. What's a constant? A constant is very much like a variable, but it cannot change. Constant. A user defined identifier for holding some value. Constants cannot change. Very important. That's why they're called constants, and they, Java chooses to use the keyword final. Some other languages use C-O-N-S-T uh, for constant. Um, one note of trivia, C-O-N-S-T or const is also a reserved or keyword inside of Java, but it has no meaning or use. Um, it's been reserved. Um, but it doesn't actually do anything. So really, you just avoid ever typing C-O-N-S-T, all lowercase within a Java program, uh, and you'll be safe. These are ints, like I was talking about before. That makes them numeric integer types. The difference between byte, short, int, and long is how... Um, how many bytes the number is stored in. A single byte integer is called a byte. A two byte integer is called a short. A four byte integer is an int. And an eight byte integer is called a long. What the difference is, is what size numbers can be stored in each one. Um, at the end of the day, it matters mostly for the sake of um, how uh, what values uh, are allowed there and what we typically do when um, choosing most of the time in Java we use ints for integer types much like floating point numbers aren't always floats integer types aren't always ints they can be bytes, shorts, ints, or longs. Um, but uh, essentially, these are stored with a sign, negative or positive, and then the numeric part, since they're integer numbers, there's nothing past the decimal point. So bytes can hold numbers between negative 128 and positive 127. Um, shorts go between about negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. Ints, um, it's uh, something like, I believe, 2.1 uh, billion negative to positive. Longs can hold between negative and positive um, uh, 2 to the 63rd. Um, I'm uh, not a fan of memorization. Don't worry about what those numbers are. You can look them up at any point. And if you try to store a number in one of them that's too big, um, the compiler will let you know. So th there's no point in memorizing what those are. Uh, I was just reading them from a chart um, just now. Uh, other than uh, I kind of, uh, or I pretty much have both byte and short um, memorized. Um, 
because I've just been doing this a long time, I don't even remember all the time like what it is that an int can hold or a, or a, um, a long can hold. But, um, you know, you, when you need to know, you it's easy to find. So um, uh, that's uh, how we'll work with it. Um, uh, one, uh, so here we'll, uh, you'll see that I'm using five and nine. Those are valid integer numbers, much like a floating point number is by default a double, um, ints or uh, integer literals by default are ints. The reason they do this is double and int are the most commonly used. Um, numeric types, and so to make the literals by default those two types is valuable. Um, if you do use a long, if I had made this final int, whoops, conversion factor one equals five, and I meant to say long, um, this would give me a problem. I have to put a lowercase or uppercase L on, whoops, uh, on the back of it to make it a long. There's another way of making um, bytes and shorts. Um, uh, we don't put a letter at the end, uh, but we'll talk about that at a different time. So for now, um, we're just working with the int and the double. Um, and I did notice right there that I had whoops, made a mistake and named these two variables the same. I meant for the second one to be two. <clears throat> so... What uh, so right now we have um, we have this uh, five and nine. They're integers. We could have made them bytes or shorts, but we made them ints um, for now, and that works out well for us. So um, that gives us all of the constants and variables, the places that store our data for doing our uh, operation here. So we are going to leave it at that. I'm putting extra white space, uh, a couple of uh, carriage returns, uh, enter keys between the variable declarations, the part where I make the variables and constants and initialize them or put literal values in them. And what happens uh, in the course of the program. Again, notice the separators, notice the operators that do the assignment. So I'm going to do um, something new here, and I am going to do output temp equals, or is assigned, it's the same operator, I am going to do um, conversion um, conversion factor one, conversion factor two divided by conversion factor one multiplied by input temp plus 32. Just to unpack what we've done here, the value of conversion factor two which is 9, divided by conversion factor 1, which is 5. Um, that This slash, th 
this right leaning slash is our division operator. Um, there is no minus with the dot above and below it. Um, so that's uh, the fraction indicator, the, the right leaning slash is very common. Um, division operator in uh, lots of programming languages. And then the asterisk uh, or star is the multiplier x, which is another indicator. Um, is reserved to be a, a character, probably as a like a user defined data type and identifier. Um, and the dot, which is another one, um, uh, just like the floating in the middle, that is again not something that you, we can type off the keyboard. So the asterisk is what is used. Input temp is, uh, indicates the value held in input temp, which we know above is 100. And then the plus is the addition. And 32 is um, an integer literal that will add on to the end. A note on the Fahrenheit Celsius conversion um, formula. We all, um, I've done these kinds of things in teaching programming for many, many years, but just something you can do if you ever want to do these conversions in your head. It's always either 5 divided by 9 or 9 divided by 5 when you're converting from one to the other. Um, it, it just remember, uh, when I go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, like I'm going to here, I want the number to be bigger because we, we know the ultimate answer here of boiling point of water is 100 at Celsius. It's 212 at Fahrenheit. So we know it's going to get bigger. So we want the 9 on top, the 5 on the bottom. Then we multiply by our, um, uh, you know, the input, whatever that happens to be. And uh, we either add or subtract um, 32 because we're going from we're trying to get bigger we're adding it if we were trying to get smaller we would subtract it um, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna leave it at that for a second just understand that we're taking the variable output and assigning it the results of this operation. Conversion factor 2 divided by conversion factor 1 multiplied by input temp added to 32. I'm going to talk more about that before we're done here today. Now I'm going to use uh, a something we looked at last time. We pronounced this system.out.println. And I, for now, am just going to put in output temp. I, I, I want to keep it simple because we're going to come back and add to this in a minute. So what I'm doing is I am calling some, uh, something called system.out.println. That is a method very much like main is a method. We're passing a parameter of our output temperature so that it can be pushed to the screen. Let's go ahead and save our work. We're going to put this in the examples for this class. Let me go to that place now. Teaching Fall 130 examples. Remember, I mentioned this last week, very important. What we call the file, temp conversion has to be the same name as the class as defined in here. Public class temp conversion, temp conversion .com. Let us go in and, oops, H drive, CD teaching, fall of 2019, CIT 130, and our examples. 
I am going to do Java C temp conversion dot Java. That's sending the, the source code to the Java compiler. When I invoke the virtual machine, which we talked about in the first lecture, um, I use the name of the class, but without any um, without any extension. And we do that, and can, uh, what you'll see is the answer is wrong. I knew that it was going to come up wrong because I have a lesson I want to teach in here. So there's a couple of things um, going on in our operation here. In or um, co conversion factor one and conversion factor two are both integers. Integer divided by integer will return an integer. So what we're looking at here is nine divided by 5. 9 divided by 5. What is 9 divided by 5? What you'll say is you'll say I'll put I have 5 goes into 9 once. I have 4 left over. I move my decimal point. 5 goes in um, to 4 8 times. So the real answer is um, 1.8. But 1.8 is not an integer. So in when you divide an integer by an integer, we get a um, we get an integer. So it will truncate the value and um, yield one. So what really will happen here is one, times a hundred is a hundred and then we add 32 to that and we get 132. So how do we get around that? One thing I could have done was make the conversion factor as a double. Problem solved. Um, but because I wanted to show you this particular lesson, um, I specifically made them ints so that I could show you another operation that's a thing we can do. If I use the separator of an open parenthesis, type in a data, a primitive type, or a data type other than what it is, technically I could, I could put it uh, as int as well, but it would just be useless. What I'm doing is I am uh, doing an, an operation called casting. I am casting conversion factor 2 as a double. Um, the term works very much like it would in acting. I'm taking an integer and having it play the part of a double. All I'm doing is telling the compiler, I want this integer to work or play the part of a double. So take it out of the uh, out of an integer type and put it in a double type. I'm not storing that um, in a variable on its own. I'm just casting it during this operation. It's the ant. It's the results of this whole piece here. Um, that will get uh, stored in uh, output temp, but I can temporarily cast it. I am going to do the same on this side. Technically, I don't have to, because if either the denominator or the numerator is a, con uh, is a floating point type, the answer will come out with that floating point answer. Um... But in this uh, case, I am going to cast both because, really, I want to use them in a floating point way. Um, then I multiply that times the 100, and um, I add the 32. Now I'll get that 1.8 multiplied, gives me 180, 
when I add the 32, um, I wind up with the 212 I want. Now, um, here, um, I'm adding an integer to a floating point. Uh, th there's no nothing to get worried about here. Uh, in this case, I can um, leave it. Um, either way is going to be fine. One thing you'll notice, if, and I go back up here to my style, whenever I, I am assigning something and I very much explicitly or on purpose want to make it a floating point type, what I will do is I will always put the point zero at the end. Um, that will differentiate my literals um, as floating point as opposed to integer. The One of the reasons I do that, if I did double x equals 5, uh, 9 divided by 5, what that is going to be is x is technically going to be 1.0. Why is that? Because it's going to do the integer division first. Integer division is, uh, yields 1. I already talked about that. Then it will convert that into the double and store it. And uh, you may be asking, well, how do I know it converts? One of the things that Java does uh, on its own is going from this from left to right in numeric types. I can store a byte in a short and it automatically becomes a short. I can store a short in an int or a byte in an int. It automatically becomes an int and is stored as an int and so on. I automatically convert any of the smaller types to any of the larger types um, without any loss of precision, so it just happens automatically. I don't have to cast to go from left to right, but I do have to cast to go um, from uh, right to left. The only time I have to cast going from left to right is when I cross that integer to floating point because then I need to explicitly say use this integer as if it were a floating point. Um, that's when I need to cast going that direction. So that's why we've done that. Another important concept that I want to uh, visit before I move on in this particular application is operator precedence. Division and multiplication carry the same precedence. That means when I'm evaluating a, a, an equation that has multiplication, division, addition, and, and subtraction, um, the division and multiplication happen first, always left to right, and addition and subtraction are done second, always left to right. There's only one addition or subtraction operation, so it happens uh, properly. In this case, what's great is I want to take this number, the 9, divide it by 5, then take that result and multiply it by the input temperature, and then add 32. So this one works as is. If we want to change the precedence, and one place we would have we would whoops would want to do that is if I do output temp equals double conversion factor one divided by double conversion version factor 2 multiplied by input temp minus 32. Um, this wouldn't come out right. If input temp was 212 here, and I'll even show you, 212 
save. Let's recompile. And re-put it out. You notice I didn't get 100 back. I got some bizarre 85.8, effectively. That's because our order of operations gets messed up in this particular one um, because it, in this case, we wanted to subtract from input temp before we multiplied it by this division. I can One of the other things I can do with parentheses other than indicate casting or the input to a method is override um, our order of operations. So now what I'm doing is I'm saying divide conversion factor 1 by conversion factor 2 and multiply it by input temp minus 32. The input temp minus 32 will happen before the multiplication because the parentheses uh, do what we call um, um, uh, we, that we turn this into what we call an atomic operation or an op, uh, the input temp minus 32 is like a number. Um, we've turned it into something atomic that goes with this other um, division so that uh, we can override our order of operations. And now you see that everything jives correctly there. Um, so in this case, I need to do that, um, that per those parentheses to keep everything nice and neat. With output um, temp as uh, uh, the, the, the first way, we don't need it. But one of the things that I do, again, the few bytes of adding parentheses um, for readability is something that uh, I do a lot. So what I like to do is I like to take this first division, surround that by parentheses. I don't need to. Divi this division would happen first anyway, but... I want to show that that's what I, uh, like, not only will it, but, uh, like, I know it will and I want to, you know, guarantee it will. And then I want to take the atomic division and multiply that to the input temperature as its own atomic operation. And then add the 32. So what, um, what I've done there is add parentheses for readability. The order of operations works without them, but I will often, uh, particularly when I have very big uh, variable or constant names like conversion factor 1 and conversion factor 2, um, I will often uh, put those parentheses in because it just makes it more readable um, to me. Uh, it just makes more sense. I want um, to go back before we uh, move on here to a couple of things. We haven't talked about our conventions in a while. You'll notice main, args, input temp, output temp, all start with a lowercase camel case rather than the uppercase camel case. One of our conventions is that variables and method names begin with a lowercase letter and additional words in the identifier are capitalized. All other letters are lowercase. Um, so 
methods and variables can be distinguished from classes by whether or not the first letter is capitalized. Um, this, is, this is not a matter of the compiler. That's why we call it a convention rather than a rule. Um, but it's what we do for readability. Variables and methods can use the same naming conventions, the same identifier conventions, because methods will always have parentheses with them. So we can always identify a method versus a variable by whether the parentheses are there. Um, I'd also like to point out that our constants here use a different convention. Conversion factor 1 and conversion factor 2 use uh, the convention for constants. Constants are written in all capital letters, all caps. Um, new words are separated by underscores. That's our convention for um, for constants. So just uh, just information to um, to hold on to that goes along um, with everything here. <clears throat> so uh, before I finish up, there's uh, two other things I want to talk about. One is the only lexical element we haven't mentioned yet are comments. I went over the two types of comments last week, um, but I will um, repeat here. Block comments start with a slash star, end with star slash. Anything in between those two places is ignored. Um, I often use that to... Um, to describe at the top of the application what's going on. This is a simple pro Java program that converts the boiling point of water from Celsius to Fahrenheit. The line comment is the double slash. This is one of those places where our carriage return, our line separator works a little bit differently. Line comments ignore everything from the slash slash up to and including the uh, line separator, uh, the line terminator, the return or enter key. So um, one of the things you'll see is um, line comments can be used nicely to go on the same line as uh, functioning code. So I could say um, this, oops, this variable will hold the final Fahrenheit value. Describe what this line does on the same line as, as, as it is on. Because the line comment doesn't, it has nothing to do with what happens before it, only from where it is till the end of the same line. Um, again, we talked uh, uh, more detail about comments last time. Uh, you'll get very comfortable with them because um, we'll be using them in absolutely every single program um, throughout this semester. So the last thing I want to do is I just want to make a little bit nicer output here. Going back, if we run the program, which technically now works, can recompile. Um, it works, um, but I want to just make it a little nicer and teach one more concept in there. Um, uh, by the way, one note, this is a side note here, make sure 
you saved your work before you recompile. If you get errors, we'll be talking about errors, debugging, um, uh, several times throughout the term. But if you forget, if you go in and fix something and forget to save before compiling again, you'll get the same error and you'll think you didn't fix it properly. Just keep that in mind because um, it's something that can frustrate and uh, I hate to see students get frustrated. So our print line statement is system.out.println. What I want to do is I want to say input temp in Celsius comma is output temp in Fahrenheit. Let's look at that and then I'll talk about it just for a second. Java C, temp conversion dot Java. 100 in Celsius is 212 in Fahrenheit. We're going to learn some really cool stuff in a, in a, in a few weeks um, about how to format this in a lot more detail um, and get some really, really nice looking output. Um, for now, um, we're just going to do it this way. You'll see what I've done is I've intermixed variables with text encaps uh, encapsulated in these double quotes. These, uh, when you have a, a double quote, some text, and another double quote, that is called um, uh, that is called a string literal. We talked about string up here. Um, we'll be learning a lot about strings in a few weeks. But for now, just understand that a string is just text that's to be looked at as a bunch of text strung together. That's where a bunch of letters and characters strung together is a string. Um, I want to um, show you one new concept. By the way, the plus here doesn't indicate addition. When we're working with strings, the plus is a concatenate. It, 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 it links the pieces together. So it's going to put print out the first thing, followed by the string, followed by the second thing, followed by the string, to make it all look like one nice little sentence. In addition to this print ln, which we pronounce print line, there's also a thing called print. The only difference between print line and print is whether we end the printing with a carriage return. Let me just show that briefly. When I compile that and run it, you'll see um, uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't do it. Uh, the, the, the operating system is compensating for me. Um, I was expecting, or I was hoping that the, um, the the prompt would be on the same line. Since this is only one line of code, doesn't matter. If we were printing out more than one thing, um, it would uh, uh, it would appear on the the same line if I use a print. Let's see that by doing this. Oops. System dot out dot print output temp in Fahrenheit. Save it, recompile, rerun. You'll see 
100 in Celsius, colon 212 in Fahrenheit. They're two different prints, but because I used print, it didn't put a return in there. If I change this to print line, recompile, now they're on separate lines. I'm going to leave them on the same line. And I am going to put in something kind of unique here. I'm going to do a left-leaning slash, what we call a backslash, and the letter T. This is a very special thing called an escape sequence. We use escape sequences to indicate um, characters that we cannot print um, in the standard way that we print um, things off the keyboard. Uh, I can't indicate a tab. I can only hit a tab key. So backslash T is the escape sequence for a tab. Backslash T is considered one letter, one character, one symbol um, for the tab. And what's cool about that is now when I save, I compile, and I run, you'll see that a nice tab is was inserted in there. Um, that makes things look real nice. So um, uh, I like to go ahead and do that and put it in. There are other escape sequences. One of the most common ones that we'll see is backslash N. That is the new line which is essentially the same thing as hitting the enter key or the return key. The new line is automatically asserted, inserted when we do the print line, um, but when we put it in, um, it uh, adds that carriage return or that, um, that new line in. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave these escape sequences in. They're things that um, you can play with and use in Homework 1, um, and they're powerful. We will be visiting them again um, at other times, and I go into some real detail in how we can print um, very special um, ASCII or Unicode characters in the advanced Java class. We talk quite a bit about that. Um, for now, just note that the backslash T gives us a tab, backslash N will give us a new line or an, or an enter. So this completes this program. We've talked uh, about a whole lot of stuff here. We talked about our lexical elements. We talked about the rules for our identifiers or our user-defined names. We also talked about some conventions, some ways that we, um, some, some things that we follow uh, voluntarily that we don't have to do to, in order to get our program to work, but we like to do because it makes our programs nice and readable. We talked about primitive types, the eight different types of data that um, Java programs work with. Um, and we talked about uh, a couple of other terms. We talked about what a block is, what a variable is, what a constant is. Um, again, I'm going to flesh out these notes a little bit and they will be uploaded into the Canvas shell. Um, I will comment out this piece of code and upload it to the Canvas shell, and um, and then the first homework will be posted in the Canvas shell for you to practice some of the things that we discussed today. Um, note, we also talked a little bit about operator precedence. Um, we'll continue to discuss that um, throughout the rest of the term. Um, as always, if you have questions or run into problems, 
uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask me. Um, otherwise, um, look for a new lecture um, within the next week. And uh, I hope you enjoyed. Take care.